Thank you for joining us for another edition of Behind the Editor's Curtain with Don Corrigan. Each edition focuses on points of interest relating to the environment and the community. And now, here's Don. We're talking this morning with Jeff DePew, and Jeff DePew is a lecturer in biological sciences, teaches a course in global climate change. I can't really list all of the different boards and organizations he belongs to. Locally, the Missouri Coalition for the Environment Board, and also uh, Citizen Science Association. So I'm particularly interested this morning, Jeff, in your global climate change course and your passion for that, because we're now in the midst of the Climate Change Summit in Paris. Uh, I'm just interested in what your reactions are to what's going on in Paris. Well, wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Don. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, I appreciate it. I, um, we are in the third day of the uh, COP21, the 21st meetings and talks on climate change that have been going on since about 1990, the Kyoto um, Protocol. And so this is a unique, truly unique piece of time right now, portion of time that has virtually every leader in the world of every nation in the world, with the exception of North Korea, um, who are meeting to discuss an environmental issue which really is affecting the climate system, the atmosphere, uh, ecosystems of the earth, our resources and how we use and protect those resources, and global health of many, many people people and really the survival of uh, hundreds of thousands of people who sure. live I thought, uh, I, thought president, I thought the president was fairly effective in fielding questions at a press conference when he said well you know these skeptics and the politicians who are poo-pooing this as they run for office better think about when they get into office they're going to have to deal with all of these leaders who are on board yes, that climate yes. change is real and that something needs to be done and he said i hope that they're just posing now for political purposes and that when they have to deal on the world stage they'll realize that we're totally out of step with the rest of the world if we continue to engage in uh, climate change science denial what, what's what's yeah, your take on that well, it, you know, it's uh, the United States is actually fairly unique in this, in that we are the only country that is really pushing back against this science, which is globally accepted. And it comes, there are some really interesting issues that come out of this COP21 recently and lately, uh, yesterday, the discussion over not whether this is happening or the science of it, but the matter of fact that um, we're deciding upon, we're making decisions to decide whether we can limit the warming of the earth to 1.5 degrees versus 2 degrees. This is what's happening with these world leaders, is that minutia of discussion. And what happens is that there, the difference between that 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees is a result of the loss of island nations, low-lying countries, and hundreds of thousands of poverty-stricken individuals who do not operate in the same level that we do in the world. President Obama is is become the uh, uh, the global climate change president, and the world is looking to him and the United States to take a stand. China, the United States, India are the three big countries that are producing the most greenhouse gases of six out of the most important greenhouse gases that are affecting our atmosphere. Well, how do you um, work as a professor? educator on this issue in St. Louis in the Midwest. I I think that we just don't think that it affects us. I mean, we, we read yeah. about the islands that are going under or some of the low-lying areas of the third world, and, and I think a lot of St. Louisans just shrug and say, this isn't my issue. Why is it their issue? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great question. I, I address this constantly throughout all of my courses in, in each semester, is that we are middle of the continent, and we have, just like every place around the world, has unique climate conditions and physical geological conditions. And we happen to live right along the mid-Mississippi River Valley and uh, right in the, uh, you know, the, the apex of the, of the jet stream. And so... Uh, the appearance of climate change for us is very different than giant storms that dump 12 inches in an hour in Arizona or that flood uh, Bangladesh or that flood the Yangtze. 
we have different conditions because we're a different place. <laughs> what we wind up looking at is extreme weather conditions, fluctuations. So I used to and still do tell students that the 1904 coin of phrase was, if you don't like the weather, wait a minute. And for us right now, the coin of phrase for global climate change is the weird places, the places that have weird weather are just going to get weirder. And mm-hmm. the places that have stable weather is going to get unstable. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we've always had weird weather and it's just going to get weirder. The fact that we have 70 degrees and, and Thanksgiving and the fact that we have uh, snow one day and then 70 degrees the next or that we have changes in our maximum and minimum temperatures of day to nighttime temperatures that drop almost 60 degrees in 24 hours is astounding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's the way it looks to us. Well, and, I was in a, a Society uh, of Environmental journalism conference in Miami a couple years ago and uh, there there's a lot of believers in climate change there because they can see what's going on with the tides and and, and they said uh, you folks in Missouri who think this doesn't affect you all these Floridians have to have some place to go and, and you're gonna have a lot of uh, new residents over the yeah. next coming decades because of this well, but, but of course uh, of course we may be moving further north because of what's happened there was a great piece by Peter Raven, an op-ed in the Post, where he was talking about just the change in what can grow here and what kind right. of pests are coming here. And yep. and so it really is going to be a dramatic change. Even if we sort of smugly think, well, we're away from the coast, we don't have to worry about right. this. Well, it already has started. The Horticultural Society has changed the the plant zone, the zone that we, you know, can plant uh, certain certain plants uh, has shifted. It's changed. We are now in a warmer zone than we were before, um, which the Horticultural Society of America is, you know, taking, you know, really big note that some trees can't survive here um, because it's too warm. This is the result of uh, perhaps some of the diseases that we see within our native trees. They're knocking down red maples and red oaks and, and a variety of other native trees that are picking up diseases because it's getting warmer. So, um, yeah, the, and there will be some, some shifts. And, of course, you, know, you start talking about wheel bees in the future, and it's very difficult for people to wrap their mind around that, which is, uh, you know, the discussion we were having of how difficult science is for some people. And, and uh, what we know is that the climate is shifting, it is changing, and it is resulting in extreme weather de- events and rising seas, loss of polar ice caps, loss of glaciers. They're melting. We can see it. We can measure it. And this is what is happening to our world. At the very beginning, um, left alone and left without any real governing of how far we'll let this go, um, then we're, we're going to wind up seeing uh, rising seas. And it, as you said, Miami is very concerned about this. I was just in Miami this this fall. Yeah, I remember you and, mentioned that uh, you, you had a conference there yourself. Yeah, I did. There was a global climate change conference yeah. <laughs> with uh, climate reality, and uh, it was uh, during the, the the high tide with the uh, the full moon, and uh, water was rushing through into the streets, it covered the streets. So the uh, mayor of Miami is very concerned and has already started with the idea of uh, adapting his city to handle rising seas. Yeah, I've noticed that up and down the East Coast, that seems to be a priority for a a number of cities. Uh, Yeah. So what's the best that we can hope for out of this climate summit in Paris? Congress seems like it's already trying to throw a wrench into gear and tell Obama that he doesn't have any uh, authority, fiduciary authority to affect things. That they're, they're gonna, what, what, what's your, do we have to wait till 2016 and hope for a different Congress or, or where are we at with this politically in the United well, I, States? Um, there's, a, there's a couple of interesting things that are happening. Uh, William Ruckelhaus, one of the first uh, administrators of the EPA, just came out and talked about this, about how, and he's a Republican, <laughs> how Republicans are treating some real problems uh, with the EPA, which is in the, in the way that the EPA was created under uh, Nixon's administration to, to try to protect our resources and protect the public. And the uh, methods that, that Obama has gone through with executive action are exactly what the EPA was set up for. Mm-hmm. So the administration could handle 
and could deal with immediate uh, circumstances. And that's, of course, what Obama has done. Uh, what we're going to have to do with the COP conference is to wait for it to play out. It's in the third day. It's going to go for uh, till the uh, beginning of next week. Uh, and then leaders will leave, and the negotiators will start to kind of piece out the uh, the path forward of what we can accept and what we can't accept with all nations speaking. And that means the most poverty, poor, stricken nations in the world, the nations that are that are low lying and island nations, uh, Africa, and then the developing nations, which are polluting, uh, you know, pumping out the most uh, greenhouse gases of, of any country. So, Rep- so, so Republican Ruckelshaus says that uh, the president is fully within his rights and using executive orders. Um, yes. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's on climate change. That's quite a contrast to someone like Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma who brings a snowball into uh, Congress <laughs> and says, uh, well, here here's the proof. Uh, climate change doesn't exist. We're going to uh, stop the president. These executive orders are illegal for him to be doing. How do you respond to that? Are you waiting and hoping that 2016 will make things different? Uh, Because polls show that the public still has climate change way down there in single digits as a major concern for them. Well, yeah, and I think until uh, <laughs> until something happens like uh, Beijing and Singapore, where uh, people can't see their hand in front of their face, then people, you know, are, are going to kick the can down the road as they have with environmental issues for the past forty years. Uh, we can't kick this issue down the road; it has to be addressed because it, it snowballs. It gets, and no pun intended, it, it it moves and it gathers momentum, and then before you know it, you wake up and. And there's a lot of pollution around you, or your water's been affected, or your food security's been affected, and then you go, well, I, uh, well how did this happen? So I think the issues that are coming out of this conference are wonderful. They're bringing up uh, ethical issues and moral issues and issues of poverty-stricken countries and poverty itself and uh, the issues of um, uh, nations that are that are very well off, ours included, that are really um, taking a lot more of the world's resources than we really we should. Yeah, you're, you're making um, a, uh, you're making an interesting point because one of the things that uh, particularly the right wing talk shows and Fox News has gone after Obama is this idea of mixing terrorism with climate change and how they yeah. think that they think that that's just totally goofy, but. Uh, hasn't the Pentagon itself done some studies about the kind of disruption that will occur in the world yeah. because of the yeah. countries, low-lying countries and third-world countries that are really just going to yeah. go underwater and, and all the displaced yeah. populations and refugees? Well, yeah, and this is a, it, it's a national security issue, and the Department of Defense, the Navy, uh, have been doing studies for the past, really, uh, 15 years, um, really since uh, 2000. What they're doing is looking at the what would happen if scenarios, and climate change is definitely addressed across the aisle uh, from Republicans and Democrats, those people that are not politicians, but are the people that are on the ground, in the trenches, and dealing with issues like food security, water security, migration, immigrants, refugees, people living one, leaving one country because it's not livable any longer and moving to other countries as uh, climate refugees. And so th- this is a real, real issue that uh, you cannot stick your head in the sand or you cannot, you know, kind of blow away. It's, it's not going to blow away. We, we've kicked the can down the road for too long and um, we're having to address these issues now. You know, you have to give uh, President Obama his due. He is addressing these issues in, in a, way ahead of the game uh, with uh, the United States. Uh, he's dragging us, kind of kicking and screaming, into uh, the global issue that every other country is dealing with, and we have uh, you know, abstained in the past. We didn't even go to the uh, uh, COP15 uh, uh, conference in Copenhagen, and we weren't even present. You know, Obama has really brought us forward into this issue, and and you you can't really compare it to terrorism. Terrorism is what's happening 
you know, right now, and we must address it. Climate change is something that has been going on for a while, and it's starting to build to a head. And if we don't address it, it's very difficult to think about uh, not having food security and water security uh, in a, a livable world. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> this is this is this is the bottom line. This is, this is uh-huh. what we all live, eat, and breathe. Sure. Um, and and that is uh, what what this conference is really bringing out is how important. This issue is resources, sustainable development goals, or another thing that the conference is bringing out, and it it is bringing it out in a in a global wide perspective uh, that's making us as the United States uh, look at with empathy the way that the rest of the world is is dealing with this issue that you know we help to create. We're, we're both um, teachers, and we deal with a lot of young people. I know. Young people I talk to are dreading the holidays, and we're at that holiday <laughs> period, and they're saying, "I'm gonna, I've got to deal with my dad, or I've got to deal with yeah. my uncle, who's a climate science denier." Do you got any advice for them? How do you deal with a climate science denier? Is, is it is it worth the trouble to argue? Or yeah, you know, that's exactly. I I listen to this yeah, just like you. You know, every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, and you know, it it is a generational change. Uh, I believe in in many many ways. These young folks uh, that are 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 are, are looking at the next 10 years and the next 20 years of their life changing. And they're looking at their environment changing, uh, national parks changing, water changing, water issues changing, uh, the myriad number of, of environmental issues that are sticking their heads up to be addressed is astounding. And they want to address it and they want to deal with it and they want a good world that they can inherit and it, of course they get miffed and angry because people are wanting to kick the can down the road or they don't want to address the issue i just tell them you know come equipped with facts and don't get hot and heavy about it but just address the facts and continue to uh, to lay out the science and the facts in front of your your relatives and then kind of the, the final statement is you know this is this is my world mm-hmm. and this is what I'm in, what I'm inheriting and I want it to be just as good as the world that you came yeah. from yeah yeah you would think seeing is believing they'd be able to bring their laptop and just show what's happening to glaciers or what Greenland looks <laughs> like or what scientists are projecting the coasts yeah. are going to look like um, yeah, I've, I've had some students do that. You know, they just pull out their laptop and, and start to show videos. Um, and, of course, you know, there's it's just, uh, Donna, just the typical, you know, blowback from people that really don't want to change or don't want to address a, an issue um, or an issue that's too difficult to really address or to understand. And I think that's where our generation really needs to be empathetic and to uh, to to hold dear uh, the the wonderful world that we've grown up in, and and want that wonderful world for our children and our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, you know, every single Native American uh, indigenous tribe that I have looked at, all speaks about uh, the future. All speaks about seven generations ahead, thinking seven generations ahead. And we have to think the same way. We, we want our children to inherit this wonderful world. And uh, having a lot of money would be great too, but, but it's difficult to spend a lot of money in a world that's, that's been, been wrecked. Uh, and let's, you know, we, we need to think and, and operate with more empathy and help these young people fulfill their dreams and mm-hmm. fulfill the dream of having a, a, a healthy, verdant, beautiful world the way that we grew up with it. Well, that, so, gets, into, that gets into the whole issue of a sustainable lifestyle and a low-carbon uh, footprint. Yeah. It's kind of an issue for another day, but I'd like to touch base with you again <laughs> on that down the road because I know you've, uh, you've done a lot of grassroots, local kinds of things yeah. when it comes to sustainability. Yeah. So anyway, we sure appreciate you talking with us Great. today. We'll all be looking at what comes out of the Paris Climate Change Summit. It's going to be yeah. uh, fascinating to see how this uh, blends into the 2016 election. 
So. Oh my gosh, I, I think it is definitely running into the 2016 elections and, and the uh, Republicans that are, uh, well, the, in anybody that's speaking without uh, really any authority and any background and any uh, scientific understanding. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I look forward to speaking with you again and love to talk to you about sustainable development goals, the world's sustainable development goals and, and uh, sustainability. And there's a lot that's linked to this conference, which sure. is coming up and there will be there'll be other conferences uh, uh, there definitely will be other conferences so it's a real positive optimistic note I think for the world community well thanks again for your time Jeff thank you Don alrighty <laughs> take care this is Don Corrigan for our Environmental Echo I hope you enjoyed our interview today have a good green day folks <laughs>